Hello, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This episode is a discussion of Robert Heinlein's libertarian science fiction novel, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Written in the 1960s, the novel is about a revolution on Luna, the colony on the moon that is populated by ex-convicts. And it's about a group of uh, loonies who ferment revolution against the hated authority in charge. In the discussion that we have about the book, there are spoilers. So if you prefer not to hear them before reading the book, you might want to read it first. So thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the discussion. Yes, uh, I read it, and I enjoyed it very much. It was a great book. Just to ask, did you read a, a translation, or did you read it in English? Because it's actually written in the... Um... You know, it's written in Luna speak, and I wondered what they did with that with the German. No, I, I read it in English, so I had an easier time to to uh, chat with you about it. Right, right, yeah, <laughs> cool. And the spe- uh, yeah, and the speech was uh, or the Luna speak was really interesting. At, at the first pages, I was really uh, uh, confused about it and what what's going on uh, until I noticed that that it's yeah the Luna speak and. But a very interesting idea. Made it uh, more realistic. Yeah. I wonder what the earliest book is that to you... I mean, I, I when I was reading it... Actually, when I, I read it when I was a boy, and then I um, listened to the audio, audiobook version that you recommended, Jake, and I enjoyed it very much. But I'm just wondering, you know, I, of course, Clockwork Orange has, has it, and, uh, you know, this... Uh, um, Dick Francis did it, and... Uh, do Android stream of electric sheep, this sort of homogenized language that is a, you know, a blending of several of the world's leading languages. I wonder what the first, this may be the first um, yeah, could, example of that. I'm not could, sure. Could be. I mean, I think it's like, I guess it's become the, like, uh, the stock science fiction, or not stock, but it's become one of the ways in which the, like science fiction imagines like, all these guys writing in a world where global trade means that, you know, you're getting in, intermingling of cultures and stuff. And, uh, and you, I guess you see the language, you see English having changed. You know, if you, especially mm-hmm. if you've grown up with English, you know, and then you meet people from, let's say you're from the UK and you go to the States or India or somewhere like that, and you see how the language gets kind of mangled and changed with diff- when, when uh, uh, trade brings different people together. And... So, yeah, I guess they were sort of extrapolating it onto um, a wider scale. And it's like, have you seen um, that series Firefly, where they do it with English and Chinese, you know? Did yeah, you know? <laughs> I was just going to bring that up as another example, right? Yeah, because I guess in, in, um, when he wrote this book, um, The Moon is a Harsh Written Mistress was written in the middle of the Cold War, so he has this idea that it's going to be, um, you know, English and Russian. Whereas um, Fireflies written was written on the rise of China, and so the idea is it's English and Chinese, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very interesting. I never thought of that. And but, I guess uh, Clockwork Orange was English and Russian also. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and yeah, probably reflecting that time as well. A lot of people I've read. Um, have said like, oh, the moon is a harsh mistress. Changed my life. It you know opened me up to libertarianism, and this book really opened my eyes and all of that. And I I was a little surprised by that because for me, like, it was a fun science fiction movie, and it was definitely you know a sort of allegory about the American Revolution. It seemed to me like the American Revolution in space, but I didn't really you know it didn't seem that deep in the sense that it wasn't you know I, I i found it more like for me this was an action movie book do you know what i mean it was like there's, there's yeah. it was like really a fun action movie about a revolution but a lot of people say that it totally changed their political philosophy and i just wonder what did you make of what did you make of the political philosophy content of it i was a little bit no i can uh, i can very much understand that uh, that maybe this book leads many people to libertarianism. I guess it's a uh, it's a good book to um, to get accustomed to to this uh, thinking. But um, I think in in some respects it's also um, not so uh, not so, uh, so well thought uh, through because of maybe that's uh, a harsh uh, criticism. But but uh, for instance, on this meeting in the beginning. 
um, they propose to make an embargo and do you, do you remember uh, and yes. they propose yes. that they shouldn't uh, export any wheat to uh, Earth and I think that's very that's a very statist idea what do you think I mean yeah yeah absolutely and they also I mean they talk about that in that meeting they talk about I mean I suppose you could say in the book's defense that that meeting represents a whole bunch of different views like well should we you know should we do an embargo should we do this should we do that and they come up with their kind of like well essentially we'll we'll um, threaten embargo and then uh, uh, you know do our own thing plan afterwards but um but I guess you know I also noticed for example that the professor de la Paz calls himself an anarchist um, but they actually are more like a, I mean, they're more like, they're, they're taking over the state, effectively. They create their own sort of revolutionary party, you know, and, and that's a very political thing to do, you know. It was, I'm like, I, I found that to be, like, this is not the, the action of anarchists. This is a bunch of highly politicized people who want to take over the state. Do you know what I mean? Yes, totally. I think uh, um, the natural um, consequence would be that a political party would evolve out of this uh, uh, revolution. And the only reason that this doesn't happen is that in the moment when the revolution succeeds, the both uh, important uh, leaders of the revolution, Professor de la Paz and, this, and, and Mike the computer, they disappear, right? And they, they, they die or, and might disappear simply. And yeah. yeah, and that was a little bit of a useful plot device for avoiding the problem of yes. what, what happens to the, you know, revolutionary party after the revolution's won. Because in this, in this story, as you say, it's like, oh, that's, that's handy. All of a sudden they're gone. <laughs> mm. Whereas in real, you know, it, and, it, it, and it's not even clear... Uh, at least I don't remember it being clear at the end of the book. Do they dissolve all the political activities of the, the revolutionaries? Or, you know, I mean, because it, it doesn't really become an anarchist society, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I haven't thought about that, but, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he doesn't explain uh, how the society works after the revolution, right? No. I mean, the, the, the book just ends there. No, and I would have, I thought it would be, you know, I mean, he could have, um, I think the reason that he talks about anarchism is because this guy um, apparently came into contact with Robert Lefebvre, who was an anarchist, sorry, the, the, the author, I mean, um, Robert Heinlein came into contact with this, um, this guy called Robert Lefebvre, who was an anarchist in America, who was teaching kind of uh, um, freedom philosophy and was a real like anarchist in the sense that we would understand it. But I get the sense that um, uh, Robert Heinlein didn't really understand that. He sort of got the bit about libertarianism, but didn't really understand what the anarchist bit was. Because it seemed to me that the model for the guys in this, they, as, it was like the American Revolution. It was like a group of sort of minarchists who want to secede from a, a faraway government. But it wasn't an anarchist revolution by any means yeah and there probably is no such thing as an anarchist revolution right i mean this is a, i mean this is something i i thought after reading the book that that a, re, a revolution can be a means to to go from one sort of government to another sort of government like you said some uh, succeed uh, succeeding from a government and becoming your own state but the um, but it's in no uh, shape or form can it be the way to become a, a anarchistic or uh, yeah government free society. Because yeah, absolutely. That. And and like I guess the only way that it could be an anarchist revolution is is essentially if everybody decided to do their own. Um, if effectively like. You know, let's say so they had the the um, the Earth Company. I can't remember what it was called in the book, right? But if everybody just said, right, I've decided I'm not paying my taxes anymore, and the guys on Earth can uh, you know go to hell, and if they start coming for taxes, I am going to defend my myself against them. 
And then, you know, they could have discussions amongst all of these um, uh, loonies who could say, like, okay, let's let's agree together to help each other, you know, defend ourselves if these guys come um, trying to take away our uh, – uh, take taxes from us. And then, you know, they could have some people who decide to – go and do something else and you know they could they could have shown debates amongst people where nobody was really potentially like um tr- sort of trying to trick others into having a revolution which is essentially all the way through this book they they're kind of trying to tr- basically manipulate the other loonies into into having a revolution um but they could have had it as a debate amongst people who just chose to take their own actions and that the revolution could have effectively emerged just by, um, well, by non-compliance with the state, you know? Uh, yes. Maybe it wouldn't, have, um, maybe it wouldn't uh, be suitable for such an action-oriented book. Maybe the fact yeah. <laughs> yeah. have been much different. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I don't think the, you wouldn't have been able to have, you know, firing a... Uh, uh, um, Uh, meteors down to earth, which I thought was quite fun. You know, all of the uh, the action side of it, and and the the um, kind of discussions about how practical would it be to build a catapult to get things up to the moon and stuff. You know, I thought that was all kind of fun. You know, oh yeah, it was very interesting, and I, that was the first time for me to to uh, think about all these things, like you know, that it's much more easy, uh, that it's much easier to to um, overcome the gravity of the moon and and how. Uh, that a day on the moon is like 20, uh, or yeah, a complete day is 28 Earth days long, and, and all these, uh, you know, details about the um, orbits of, of the moon and, and the Earth were really, it was kind of interesting to, to think about all this stuff. And, um, yeah, I found that fun as well. I, I, I like that. But I definitely felt, I think in some ways, that, you know, if you read something like Iron Rand or something else, Those, those, there are books which are really about political philosophy in a very deep way, and this was more like you know the the action movie version of a minarchist revolution. It wasn't really a political philosophy book in that sense, you know. Oh yes, mm. true. I think it's interesting that apparently it did seem to have an effect on people getting interested in in, in libertarianism, and maybe it sort of you know, got them interested enough to find out more about, you know, the debates amongst freedom-oriented people as well. So that's cool if, if that's the case. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I'm surprised, you... surprised they haven't made a movie out of this. Yeah. Actually, it would be, yeah, it would be a really good candidate. So maybe, maybe it's coming down the road right now when, when although since at a shot is only a limited success maybe yeah yeah they might say not another libertarian movie they don't make any cash <laughs> mm, yeah. did you have what else what else what else, what other thoughts did you have about it well um i i mean other parts that i enjoyed about the book were for instance uh, this um this uh, part in the book where they described the uh, parliament so the, in the in the brief intermediate uh, period they, they set up uh, like a parliament and they, they have to or a congress and they have to debate about a new um uh st- statute for or a new body of law for the moon yeah like and a constitution or something yeah. in the in the in this congress and um and it's really funny uh, and i believe heinlein mocks a little bit the politician types we we have nowadays in, in this period and when he when he uh, yeah shows all these politicians uh, suggesting uh, crazy laws and stuff and, and I think that's I enjoyed these passages really uh, a lot um, yes yeah absolutely I think he was definitely um, sending up and I, I, I sending up the politicians I like the fact that um, Professor Bernardo de la Paz is also essentially just trying to create talking shops where he can keep the sort of i guess the intellectuals who want to use state power to aggrandize themselves he creates these talking shops where those guys can can just debate with each other for as long as possible and to let everyone else get on with it you know what i mean yeah exactly yeah it's good strategy yeah. Um, 
funny way around for this. You can see quite a lot of the uh, 1960s in this novel, though, don't you think? It's got, like, the social attitudes and everything. It's a very... It feels like a very 1960s atmosphere, uh, like, especially the way that men and women relate to each other and stuff like that. Yes. Mm-hmm. I, I, I see what you mean. Although, um, I mean, I, I don't know so much about the 1960s, so... Um... But sometimes, yeah, especially in, in the way uh, they they treat the women, I mean, the, the um, they have uh, the customs are much different, right? In, in this book. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess he does spend a lot of time also trying to imagine. He tries to imagine different marital arrangements. I got a bit bored of that because, um, you know, he keeps talking about these group marriages, and I can see what he was mm-hmm. doing uh, because I know that in the um, in the West, when America was Sorry. being when America was being settled, um, they did have like ten men to every one woman, or something ridiculous like that. So they had these sort of you know different types of marriage and family relations because basically there was you know there was limited <laughs> limited resources i suppose of of people so they had to make do and i guess this book was trying to imagine a similar kind of thing on the moon do you know what i mean ah oh, i see yeah i see what you mean i think that so, was i imagine that that was why he did this sort of long discussions about you know how marriage had evolved differently is that he was trying to imagine something like the wild west on the moon and different social relationships, like marriage relationships, that would evolve. Mm-hmm. But I got the sense, like when I when I say it's a bit like the sixties, I yeah, I meant more just in terms of the language that men and women use with each other. It's a bit like um, you know those Austin Powers movies. Do you remember the those the comedies, the Austin Powers? Like that was. I'm sorry, I didn't see see them. Okay, well they were they were basically making fun of the 1960s, um, these, these comedies. In the 60s, it's very much like, obviously in this book, right, it's like the, the women are, have big tits and are very attractive and tall and, like, the men are, you know, firing guns and very, you know, it's kind of, it's a little bit old school in terms of the stereotypes, you know what I mean? Stereotyping. <laughs> yeah, basically, I thought they were kind of stereotypes, the way that the men and women uh, spoke to each other. Yeah, exactly. But I, I read um, another book of Heinlein, uh, A Stranger in a Strange Land. It, it's the same thing there. I mean, I guess it's typical for... Uh, I, what I wanted to say is that it, I believe it's typical for Heinlein to, to display women and, and, and or the gender relations in, in that way. And he does it in other books as well. Um, yeah. Stranger in the Strange Land, you're saying, is, is like a similar kind of thing? Exactly, yeah. Do you remember this passage about the law system on Luna, about judges and stuff? No, I'm not. What, which bit are you referring to? Yeah, there's there's one uh, bit in the book where um, this uh, Earth character is also uh, in, introduced. Uh, I forget his name right now. But um, three kids on, on Luna, they, they try to uh, find a judge uh, to... to um, uh, press charges on on this um, on this guy. Who, oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah, it's a bit like finding a dispute resolution organization, isn't it? Yes, a, yes, a little bit. But it was also very strange. And I'm, I'm not sure I, I understand how it, how it works in in this book. They just they just go to anybody and ask if if uh, he's going to be a judge and. Uh, did, did you understand what, what, how, how this works? Um, yeah, I actually thought that was quite cool in the book. Um, so basically, it was in the, he, he was literally talking about private justice or a dispute resolution organization. So the way, that, the, like, the, the way he imagined it in the book is that on Luna, if people come into a dispute, you go to a third party and you both agree that this third party will be your adjudicator and if you both agree then you both essentially pay this third party to be your judge and then he 
um, you know, listens to the evidence of your dispute and comes up with what he thinks is a just solution and so forth. And so, the, yeah, they were basically talking about uh, um, private law, which I thought was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's cool that you bring that up. I mean, I was just um, a little bit confused that that um, he he would um, he would accept this offer. So, as a, as a, the main character of the book, he would accept this offer to be the judge so uh, easily and 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 don't give it so much thought and contemplate uh, the death penalty for for the accused party so uh, yeah. easily. It was all very. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was a little bit surprised. I mean, I, I, I would think that that um, much more thought would, would have to go in, in decisions like this. And... Yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess he also was attempting to, he wanted to, um, you know, downplay the, uh, the he, he wanted to try and convince the kids not to kill this guy, I think. Because, um, right. like, yeah, the other idea that I guess the author was trying to show was that on Luna, you know, it, because there was, um, life was so harsh and because everybody was in a sense trading and relying on each other, you could easily, if you get ostracized or if you piss off the wrong people, you could easily be killed. And mm -hmm. consequently, everybody is incredibly polite to each other, which I thought was an interesting idea too, that, you know, Un, it, it, like whereas the wild west is often portrayed as being this place where people were you know in the sort of myth or legend of the wild west people are all kind of like you know rude and mean to each other he was like in, in this book he was suggesting that in that in the kind of environment where life is on the edge and there's no real state and people are surviving as individuals then actually everyone's really polite and helpful because you don't want to, you don't want to get into conflict unless you really have to. And I think um, this conflict that comes up in the story is more like there's a tourist who doesn't really understand their ways. And, uh, and the, um, you know, the, the lunar guys are going to, yeah, basically kill him. Um, so, yeah, I think there was a bunch of ideas that he was showing in there, which um, some of which might be working better than others. But I thought it was quite cool that he had an idea of private law and uh, that you would pay for a judge. Um, as to why someone would want to be motivated to accept it in terms of the, what you were saying, that's an interesting question. You know, would you really want to be um, uh, acting as a as an individual dispute resolution organization in a death penalty type case? Um, that's a that's a tricky one, but yeah, I guess that was the idea. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it's really an interesting passage of the book, uh, and yeah, I think it's cool that, that he um, he um, has a uh, dispute resolution um, solution here and, uh, and and describes something like this in the book. That's really great. Yeah. Yeah.